when you enter the presence of a powerful person, you would expect protocol, correct? You just can't just waltz in. Uh, the first time that I was invited uh, to come down and pray for the vice president's staff, uh, it was uh, right after uh, Trump was uh, 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 won the presidency. Uh, that first Easter, uh, I got a phone call uh, from the uh, vice president's uh, chief of staff for like a community religious outreach, uh, and they wanted to know if I would come down and pray for the staff. Uh, and I told them I was really busy. It was Easter week. Uh, and I'd have to think about it. So uh, I, I hung up and my, I told my staff, you know, they were like, who is that? And I told them, uh, it was, you know, Lonnie from the White House. And they're like, what did you tell them? I said, well, I told them, I, I don't know if I can come down there. I'm busy. My church is first, correct? Yeah. And, uh, and, and so uh, they were all like, you've got to call them back. So, so I did. And, and uh, I rearranged my schedule and I worked my day off that week so I could actually uh, go down and pray for the vice president's staff. So I, I went down there. Now, do you think you just walk into the vice president's office and pray for his staff? No. So I found out the very first thing that they wanted from me was my social security number. I don't give that to anybody uh, for obvious reasons. But if you can't give it to the Secret Service, who can you give it to? So I gave them my social security number and they did a background check and found out I am not a criminal, I'm not a terrorist, I'm a good guy, all that kind of stuff. So I got on the metro, took the metro down, got off uh, down near uh, 17th Street, walk, walked up you know, to the... the the, the, the guard booth on that, uh, I guess that's the uh, west side of the building, uh, to go into the executive office building. I gave them my ID. They looked up who I was. They gave me a, a badge back. I hung it around my neck. I went uh, through a, a door, a, a thick door. It was a wood door, but it was a, like a blast door. And I went through that door, and then and I, was, uh, I had to stand on this padded area. There was a guard dog there. He looked very hungry. I didn't move much. Um, and that was, that was kind of like the bomb sniffing room, as I'm, I'm thinking. Like if you have any kind of residue of, on you, that would suggest you had weapons or anything like that. So then from there, I went into another room uh, that had a conveyor belt, typical like an airport, put your stuff in there, belt everything on the tray, go through there. It's full of guards. They're uh, heavily armed. Uh, I made it through there. And then once I made it through there, I was pretty much on my own. I, I could go with my batch wherever I wanted to. And, uh, and over the, the next few months, as I went down there other times, uh, I was able to just kind of like walk wherever. But the first time I went in there, I was kind of scared to death. Uh, so I went in there and I was walking, trying to find the vice president's office. When I finally got to his office, there was like, uh, I don't know, probably about five or six really big dudes in suits standing outside his door. And I knew exactly who they were. Well-groomed, physically fit, no body fat, weapons, the whole shebang. And here I was, you know, and I'm walking up to them. I'm like, what do you do to those guys? Like, could you part, get out of my way? I mean, what do I tell them? Uh, and so I, ca I came up to him. The door happened to be open to the office. Um, uh, the chief of staff was sitting there. He's like, hey, Pastor Marty, good to see you. I'm like, oh, praise God. Somebody knows me. So you guys back off. So I went in. Uh, and uh, so they hooked me up with the staff. Uh, that day, the vice president couldn't come to the prayer uh, and that was the first day they were going to do this prayer. And so they, and there, was a, there was a conference room uh, right next to his office. We were going to go in there, but there was a news crew coming. So I couldn't, I couldn't go in there with them. So we went to another room, the war room or some other kind of uh, room that had some rich history. And there was about seven of us. We went in there and we prayed. We were in there for about an hour. Wouldn't you go pray for the vice president staff? No matter whether they're Republican or Democrat? Uh, I would. Uh, and, uh, and so that was the, the first of several times of going down and praying for them. When I left that day, the chief of staff told me, thank you for praying for us because we face evil itself. I said, I know you do. That's why I'm here. But do you think I just waltzed into that office? No, I had to follow a proper protocol. So if it took proper protocol to get into the vice president's office and still does, uh, I have a simple question. Do you think God has no protocol? You can just waltz in, no problem, hands in your pocket. Hey, what's going on? What's going on, dude? Does it matter how you talk to him? What say you? Yeah, you forgot these, these are talking sermons? You, you forgot with the mask on and everything? Yes. Uh, there's proper protocol when you approach the, the, the throne room of God. Um, so we know from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says that we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. So when I, as a Christian, walk into God's presence, I have confidence I'm not going to be vaporized when I walk in there because he's holy. I also know from uh, Romans 8, 15, that when I walk before him, I can, I can call him Abba Father. Abba is the Greek word for Father. I can call him Father because I am now a son. Uh, but do I just run in there willy-nilly, not thinking about anything? No, there's great protocol. Now, there's one man in history uh, that found out about the protocol of walking into the presence of God. His name was Isaiah. Uh, he tells you what it was like in Isaiah 6. 
Uh, Isaiah 6 uh, verse 1, here's what he said about the protocol of going into God's presence. He said, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with his train, his robe, filling the temple. At that day and time, the greater the train, the robe of the king, the greater his power. Uh, When you see Christ face to face, you're going to have to be careful not to step on his robe. It's everywhere, because he's the king of kings. But back to my sermon. So the seraphim, the angelic class, the seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and two he flew. One called to the other and said what? Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. That's what they say in Hebrew. Because I think angels speak Hebrew, by the way. Um, Is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is the word for armies, angelic armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations, when they did this, of the of the. Uh, trembled at the voice of him who called out as the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, when I saw this, this is awesome to be here. This is, this is righteous. What did he say? No. Woe is me. Why? Well, in our vernacular, I'm toast. It's over. I'm ruined. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, Then at that point, he recognizes his sin. Then one of the seraphim flew uh, to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from uh, the altar in in front of God's presence with some tongs. uh, And he touched it on my mouth and he said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Translated, God can now talk to you. You just passed protocol. What's the first thing that, that you would see if you stepped into the presence of God? Your sin. Why would you see your sin? Because you just saw his holiness. And you just heard the angels chanting 24-7 that he's holy. That's all they chant. So you walk into that room. It's filling full of smoke. You're on the glassy sea of the the floor around his throne. You can see through it. It's translucent. It's amazing. There's probably flashings of lightning from what we know of other texts. It's an ominous place to be. And this is where we said as sons and daughters of Christ, we can walk with confidence into his presence and call him father. But what's the protocol as you walk into his presence? This is what David talks about. He says, what is the protocol? Because the longer you walk with Christ, the greater the temptation to forget the protocol. You can get lazy and not go through the proper protocol. So we want to look at that protocol for entering the presence of God. It's what these five verses are about. And there's so much here. I I was even thinking about doing a two or three part sermon just on those five verses. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do 30 parts. I'm just kidding. This is Marty joke. Um, What is the protocol? Well, let's look at it. Uh, first, in verse 1, there's the question for the would-be worshipers. So if you as a Christian want to walk into the presence of God, uh, how, how, how do you prepare yourself? Uh, two Socratic questions. Notice what he says. This is a psalm of David. What did David write and sing? O Lord, question 1, who may abide in your tent? Question 2, who may dwell on your holy hill? Uh, spiritually sensitive want to, people want to know how... How do I approach the holy God? I mean, if I was Isaiah, what do I need to do? Now, we know that just not anybody can walk into the presence of God. Uh, From a New Testament perspective, your life has to be covered uh, by faith in the personal work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And once you have that faith statement, his sin covers you. So you are positionally holy. And 1 Corinthians 1.30 tells you that you have his holiness. So you, you are positionally holy. The problem is your practical walk. How many sinned this week? Anybody sin? You probably sinned this morning when you got up. Just try and go through the day, not have a thought sin, verbal sin, any kind of sin. It's impossible, is it not? But what counts is that as a Christian, your body's covered by the blood of Christ, so you're positionally holy. But what David is talking about here is your practical holiness. You you have getting cleaned up before you walk into the presence of God. So uh, an Old Testament saint, uh, to get into the uh, the the tabernacle or the temple, uh, there was only one door that led in. And the very first thing that you would see is the, is the altar of sacrifice. And that's where you would offer your burnt offering according to Leviticus 1, where you would put your hands on, the, on the, the lamb of a year old lamb that was unblemished, and you would confess your sin on the lamb with the priest. He would then take your sin that had been displaced to the lamb and slay the lamb and put it on the fire of the altar. When that fa- a fire of God burned that sacrifice, that, that wrath was diverted against the sacrifice, not against you. You couldn't get into God's presence unless you came with the right kind of sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad I have the right kind of sacrifice. That when God calls me home, uh, it's truly home. Because Christ prepared the way. 
But David's talking about on a daily basis when you want to walk into God's presence and pray, what must one do to prepare themselves? Uh, he says, who, who can dwell on your holy hill? That's, uh, he's, he's speaking about the tabernacle here. The tent of God is the tabernacle, uh, which, which preceded the temple that Solomon eventually built. Uh, and the holy hill is Mount Zion, upon which the temple uh, was eventually built. But he says here, who can abide in your presence? The, the Hebrew word here is gur. Uh, and gur is the word for an illegal alien. Don't you find that it's interesting? God, what alien can come into your presence? Because it is not normal for a man to be able to walk into the presence of God Almighty. Why? Well, uh, he is holy. And we're by definition not holy, according to Romans 5, 12 to 21. Uh, he's divine and celestial. We are quite not divine and we are terrestrial. Um, so David's looking at this and saying, God, as a person who is an alien, who doesn't really belong in your presence, uh, what do I need to do to prepare myself to get there? So he's going to answer this in verses uh, 2 through 5. Uh, the answers. There's going to be 10 answers. And before we look at the 10 answers for how a person prepares themselves to get in the presence of God, you, I want you to ask yourself, am I aware of these things? Are, are, are any of these things in my life? And if anything that's positive here that's in your life, give thanks to God because that ushers you into his presence. But if you don't feel like your spiritual walk and your worship is all that great, uh, the problem is not with God, it's with you. Because it's sin. And so Paul, or Pete, or not Paul, David, uh, is, is talking about what a man must do to clean themselves up before God to get ready to walk into his presence. So uh, David's list is not exhaustive. He only mentions 10 things. There's more than 10 types of sin that you could list in the New or Old Testaments. So this is not exhaustive, but it's just... Him looking at his inner life and saying, what are some of the big 10 things I should be paying attention to? Number, number two, uh, he's going to go back and forth in these few verses between the positive and the negative. So verse four is going to be, or verse uh, two is going to be uh, positive. Verse three is going to be negative. Verse four is going to be positive. And verse five A is going to be negative. He vacillates back and forth. Why? Well, because you do have positive net gain in your spiritual walk, Right? You do get moments of victory where you grow up in the faith. Those are the positive things that God sees that usher you into his presence. Then there's the negative things. When you do blow it and compromise, those are the things that you need to work on. So we all have these. So let's look at them. The positive first. Aren't you glad he started there first? What did he say? Well, you should be looking for these things. Positively, the first three things. Verse two, uh, God's looking at these things. He who walks with what? Integrity integrity. And number two, uh, the one who works righteousness. And three, positively, the one who speaks truth in his heart. To walk in integrity. Uh, this is a, a participle. Uh, and this participle is, is uh, uh, grammatically translated as, as like a, a, a durative. It's an ongoing thing. So it's a lifestyle. He's not just saying occasionally you have integrity. No, you are known for integrity. DC is dripping with integrity. The news services are dripping with integrity. Mm -hmm. Have you listened lately? It's like, who can you believe? Because so many people uh, have, have no integrity. The first time I went to go buy a used car, a friend of mine who's in banking, I went to him and said, okay, how, what's the best way to approach buying a, a used car? He said, just realize when his mouth is moving, the sales guy, he's lying. <laughs> really? That's a low view of human nature. It's true. I found out when I went to, on the parking lot with my lovely wife to buy a used car. So integrity. Um, you have to ask yourself, when I, when I walk into God's presence, the very first thing he's looking at is, do you possess integrity? Because integrity means that you're not lying about things. Uh, what does it mean to be a person with integrity? I'll, I'll click down through some uh, lists that I put together. Uh, you might have your own, but here's what I think when I come to the word integrity. You're a person of your word. That what I tell you is what's going to happen. Um, you have lofty principles you're going to never compromise. And uh, that's a person with integrity. This, these principles are so like transcendent. I don't care what happens in my culture. I will, I will not waffle on these. Um, you're not a proverbial weather vane going with the culture. I mean, I, I'm not into that. I mean, it's what, is, what God's truth is. Transcends time. What is sin is sin. It's always sin. What is holy is always holy. And so you're not one that changes with the, with the seasons. Uh, you can be utterly trusted with whatever is given to you. Um, you'll, which means you'll never break a trust. 
Uh, you monitor the little things in your life because you know those little things, if you compromise, will become big things. Uh, you embrace valid criticism uh, and you efface invalid criticism because there's a difference between the two because you have integrity. Uh, you're not known for hypocrisy. Uh, you are very careful how you talk or write about or to others. Uh, you are the same person in private that you are in public. That's a person with integrity. Uh, I would say it's in short supply in our culture. But if you're a Christian, you should be known as a person who has integrity so that when you walk into God's presence, God looks down and says, you've had integrity all week. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Which means if you don't have integrity, it, it minimizes your worship of God. But if you have it, more power to you. It's, it's one of the great things God's looking for. Number two, second positive trait, is a person who works righteousness. Righteousness. Uh, uh, the word for righteous is another participle. Uh, the verb works uh, is another participle related to righteousness. And righteousness uh, is a word that denoted just weights, good weights. I don't know, man, do you go shopping with your wife at, at, at the grocery store? A lot of guys don't go. Do you go? Do you, I went to, a, I ran into a wife the other day in, the, in a Safeway. I uh, was talking to her, goes to church here, and she said, you know, my husband has never been to the grocery store with me in all our years of marriage. I don't know, how, how often do I go, Liz? It's a great place for a date, especially during coronavirus. You can't go anywhere else? Go to Safeway, walk around the produce section. Uh, and it's a great way to control cost as well. <laughs> as she reaches for the Rosarita beans and they're $1.25, you can find the cheaper knockoff. Hey, honey, how about this? Uh, and have a huge argument right there in the aisle, right there. Work on your marriage. Um, <laughs> doesn't happen with us anymore. But if you go into the produce aisle and you go to the scales, who wants to go buy? Ben pick a fruit. I mean, uh, apples, whatever. Who wants to go there and not be able to trust the weights? Right? I mean, if you put it on there, you want it to be whatever it says. If it's 59 cents a pound, whatever, you want it to be just so that you're getting uh, a, the right deal. Who wants to go to the gas station if you paid attention? Uh, are, don't they have on there that they've been tested, the weights? I mean, to make sure that you're getting as much gas as you possibly could. See, that's the word for righteous. Righteous is that which is just. You can count on it. Uh, if you want to learn what it means to be a person who works on righteousness, just study Jesus. So what should a Christian be doing? Reading the New Testament, reading the Gospels, looking at Jesus and saying, do I do that? Do, do I act like that? Do I talk like that when I'm mistreated? See, Jesus uh, helped the sick and the hurting constantly, constantly, ne never turned them away. Uh, he purposely hung out with outright sinful people. I mean, uh, in Mark 2, verses 13 to 17, says he did. I mean, they, he hung out with people that were so evil that when the religious leaders saw it, they were like, what is his issue? How can he do this? Uh, he spoke truth to mean-spirited people. Boy, did he. Uh, he monitored his inner purity in Mark 7, verses 14 to 16. Uh, John 13, before he was crucified, it says he, he got down uh, with a basin of water and a towel and he washed the disciples' feet prior to his crucifixion. Whose feet should have been washed that night? His. Tells you a lot about ourselves. We're preoccupied with ourselves. Jesus said, no, let me hear me, let me serve you. See, that's works righteousness. Uh, he personally met with a Samaritan woman at a well one day. See, the Jews didn't even walk through Samaria. Why? Well, we don't like that ethnic group. And Jesus said, as they're traveling uh, north, he goes, we're, we're gonna step on the soil of Samaria. And not only that, I'm gonna talk to a woman of all people. Verboten in their culture. He did two things talk to a, a person, an ethnicity that they couldn't stand because the Samaritans were a result of a interbreeding. And once the Assyrians under Tiglath-Pileser destroyed the Jews in 722, they brought other people in to that area and they intermarried with the, the Jews and produced this half-breed people called the Samaritans. Full-blooded Jews hated them. Wouldn't even walk on the soil. What'd Jesus do? Well, he loved the lady enough to, to go to where she was and then challenged her as to what is truth? What is life? And he's, he's the water of life. And she's, she's merely pulling water out of a well that will keep her thirsty from day to day. He said, I'm, I'm the water of life. You know, so what, what does that mean for us? Well, if you are one who wants to worship well, then follow Jesus in works of righteousness. Go, go over to a person of another ethnicity and reach out to them and love them and care for them. What's the matter with our culture? Church hasn't done that enough. We haven't done that enough. Understand their pain, their woe, what they're experiencing, but then be ready to give them the truth of the gospel. The gospel, that's what Jesus did. Uh, works of righteousness. 
trait number three that God looks for, people who want to worship him and do well in their worship. Uh, he says uh, in, in this passage, um, it's a person who speaks truth from his heart. Psalm 15, 2, a person who speaks truth from his heart. See, it's what comes out of your mouth tells you the condition of your heart. It's what Jesus says in, uh, in Matthew 12, 34, that what comes out of your mouth shows the condition of your spiritual heart. Matthew 15, notice what it says in verse one. Jesus said this multiple times. It says, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, which is what the Pharisees were all worried about, but it's what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. I mean, you can tell where you're at spiritually by just listening to how you talk. Because if your language is off-colored and, 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 and compromised and mean and vicious and vile language, etc., Jesus said that just tells you where your heart is. It's a person who speaks truth and it starts with the heart. So think about it if you're a husband. Uh, if you've been married for some time and your wife comes to you and says to you, honey, how are you doing? If you're a truth-speaking man, you're just gonna grunt, right? Uh, good, uh. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Is that what you're gonna do? You laugh because you can identify you did this this, this weekend? Yeah, G guys are good at this. But if you are a true speaking man and your wife comes to you and says, hey, how you doing? You haven't been talking much lately. I mean, you seem kind of moody. I mean, like what's going on? You will be open and transparent and talk with her. And that's how you build a relationship that, that lasts a long time is quality. It's that speaking truth from the heart. Uh, if you are a son and you are a saint, uh, and, and, and you have a mom and a dad, uh, that means that you're gonna say truthful things to them and not deceive them so you can do things that they wouldn't approve of. You're gonna tell them the truth. Uh, if you are a, a college student uh, and you've graduated and you're looking for a job during the virus and they're hard to find, you're not gonna pad your resume to make yourself look better than you really are. You're gonna be, you're gonna be truthful. You're gonna be truthful. Uh, if, you are, if you are a used car salesman, what does that mean? you're gonna tell the truth about the vehicles in question. When I was in college and sold uh, boats, deep sea boats and lake boats out of LA, and my roommate's dad, uh, Mr. Fletcher, owned the largest boat dealership in LA. I, and I didn't even know anything about the boats. So when they asked me if I wanted to sell boats, uh, they said, hey, here, here's all the books of all the products, read all these books, memorize all the specs, and you can totally sell these boats. So I started doing that when I was in college. Uh, I led the team selling used boats that were out back. I mean, boats that had all kinds of issues. And all the other salesmen were like, why aren't you selling the new boats? Why are you always selling the old boats? I'm like, hey man, commission is a commission. And then how are you selling so many of those used boats? They've been sitting there for years. Well, I take people out there and I tell them the truth. It's gonna sink in five minutes. <laughs> you know, I'm telling the truth. This trailer, I don't know, it's got an axle issue. You know, you might wanna fix it. I tell them the truth. So uh, a person who has a, a truth in their being is going to be, then come into the presence of God and he's gonna say, I find you acceptable. If you're not a person who tells the truth, then God's gonna say, you need to deal with your propensity to lie and deceive before you waltz into my presence. So let's look at it this way. You're a single person, you're dating, you're looking for love of a lifetime. You get onto eHarmony, you put all your information in uh, saying everything about you. Do you use your real picture? I'm just saying. Do you give them the real stats? Or is it a picture of you like 15 years ago? I mean, is it, I'm just saying, things I have heard from people in church. <laughs> yeah, it's like I've, I've had guys tell me, the girl in the picture was not the girl that I met at glory days. It was two different people. I mean, I've heard all these things. So do you tell the truth? Do you tell the truth? Uh, because this can affect your ability to worship greatly in God's presence. What about the, the negative things? Well, there's a lot of negative things. Uh, that he covers in verses uh, three and following. He says uh, a person that can come into God's presence is a person um, who does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. So these are the, these are the three bad negative things. He says, first of all, number four is he doesn't slander with his tongue. Uh, the word to slander, uh, ragal in Hebrew, is uh, related to the, the word for foot in Hebrew. Interesting. Why in the world would the word for slander be related to feet? Because if you're a gossip, you're a slanderous person, what are you doing? You're walking around cubicle to cubicle, picking up info on people, sounding like you really care about them. You're gathering info, trying to overhear what they're talking about so you can take the information, twist and turn it to destroy that person. That's a slanderous person. Does that go on in DC? 
daily slander. Could you imagine how quality the news would be, how amazing politics would be if no one from either party slandered the other side? It would be awesome. You're so quiet because you know it's not gonna happen. Uh, but I wish that it would. See, a slanderous person is the one who runs around with information. And um, the word uh, in Hebrew also means to spy on people. Spy on people. Slander destroys a person's worship of God. You know, when you, when you think about uh, places like Twitter, uh, there's tons of slander on there. I don't go on there. It's just not worth it. Uh, Facebook, that might be great to a point, but there's tons of slanderous things that are put on there. See, even those types of things are what God would look at. And God says, now, maintain your tongue and how you talk to people and you talk about other people. Slander. Hebrews 4.13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes with whom we have to do. Translated, God sees all I do. He hears all I speak. I, I need to have myself in order because this, this can infect my worship. Fifth, David says a person who's... Uh, uh, godly is a person who doesn't do evil toward his neighbor. Um, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus put it, uh, your neighbor in perspective with these familiar words. Uh, he was asked, a teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Out of the 10 commandments and the 614 additional commandments, I mean, boil them down for me. And he, he said to him, uh, number one, you shall love God how much? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all, everything you've got, love God. Second, well, second greatest commandment, you could summarize the entire Torah, is you should love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. What's missing in our country? Love a God, which then translates into love a neighbor. Love a neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Well, anybody and everybody. Uh, how should neighbors treat each other? Well, with great respect. Do you like your neighbors that are around you? You have issues with any neighbors that are around you? Do you? I, I do. Consider this neighbor. He felt like his neighbor had encroached on his property, so when his neighbor was gone one day, he took a sawzall. And he cut his garage in half. That's neighborly. Yeah. Is that Christian? Uh, no. No, but that's, that's exactly what happened. That's, that's not neighborly. Um, here, here's another situation. I, <laughs> this actually happened. Uh, when I was a gardener, uh, I had, a, I had a guy come to me. He, was, he owned a plumbing company. And I was taking care of a really nice property in a really nice part of town. Uh, and there was a, a, a plot of grass in between them, really nice dwarf fescue with a beautiful tree in the middle of it. Uh, and the, so there was a banker that owned this corner house and there was a plumber that owned the house next to it. So the plumber came to me one day as the gardener and he said, hey, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, what's up? He goes, I don't, I don't like this tree. And he said, how do I get rid of this tree? I go, well, I, I don't think you can because it's, 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 it's in the middle of the property. I mean, you guys both own this box. So you can't, you, you can't kill it. He goes, well, if I spray the trunk with Roundup, will that kill it? <laughs> I can't believe he's asking me this. He wasn't from my church. I said, hey, I said, hey uh, if you spray Roundup on the trunk, it will not kill it because it's a systemic spray. You got to spray the leaves. Okay, cool, man. Thanks. <laughs> eh, you know, came back the next week. Guess what? tree was dead. And I talked to the plumber. I'm like, what happened to the tree? He goes, I sprayed the leaves. I killed the tree. And the banker's wanting to know, what happened to my tree? I didn't do anything. I mean, you're, I think it was your neighbor. See, neighbors can do things like this, but if you have a vendetta with your neighbor, you're not supposed to do mean things to him. Why? Because that's not godly. It affects your worship of God. I mean, it's that simple. It's that simple. Are you truly neighborly toward those around you? Uh, another thing he says, it's a person, number six, is a person who doesn't take up a reproach against a friend. The word for reproach in Hebrew means a personal attack. A personal attack. Um, the president's uh, press secretary, Kaylee, have you watched what happens to that young woman in a press conference? It's basically not about the news, it's just about constant personal attacks. Over and over and over. I'm like, what about the news? Let's ask them news questions. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. It's the personal attacks against people. Are, that, that's just what the city is. How sad God must be. But no Christian should be named among those people uh, of attacking somebody uh, with, in, in a godless way. We're to be salt and light to people, speaking words of, of healing and help. 
But David says, you know, if you, if you live in a world of personal attacks, yeah, your worship before God's throne is not going to be holy. It's not going to be powerful. Godly dispositions are, are numbers seven through nine. He says, uh, the, uh, positively, a person who's growing in the faith and has great worship is one in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who also honors uh, those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own heart, hurt, and he does not change. What's a reprobate? Item number seven. Uh, he's telling you here, who do you hang out with? Who are your friends? Because whoever your friends are, you're going to start emulating them. So if your friends are godless, you're going to begin to emulate, emulate what they do. What they do. Um, I was walking with a bunch of my friends into a pool hall one night. It was connected to a bar. And my mom told me uh, when I was younger, and I never got this out of my head, so I'll put it in your head so you can enjoy it. She, she put this in my head, and this is what she told me. She said, son, always remember as you walk through life, always ask yourself whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whoever you're with, Ask yourself this one question. If the trumpet sounded of God, would I be happy that he found me here? That wrecked a whole lot of interesting things for me to do as a young man. You know, I was going into this bar, pool hall with my friends, and I knew they had already been doing some rowdy things, and I was with them. And I'm walking in there, and I'm back farther, farther, farther as they're going in. Finally, one of them turned around and go, hey, man, what's up with you? I can't go in there. I, I turned around and went out and got in my car because of my mother. I just knew if I walked in there, I'd hear the trumpet of Gabriel and it's over for me. Lord, I was just evangelizing in here. Yeah, right. Yeah, so reprobates, who are you hanging out with? Because your friends can positively or negatively affect your worship of God. Who are your friends? Uh, here's another one. You're a person uh, who uh, swears uh, to your word, that your word is your word. That's a person who has integrity, integrity. It's a person who swears to his own hurt. That no matter what he said he would do, that's what he's going to do. Uh, years ago when I was in seminary, uh, Liz and I left Dallas Seminary. We flew home to Northern California. I went to my mom's uh, sister's house, my Aunt Roberta, my Uncle Tony. He was a farmer. They were well-to-do uh, Northern California farmers. So they had a lot of well-to-do friends. So I was, I was a gardener at Dallas Seminary. I uh, drove the tractor, worked on the grounds at the school. And so I was home on vacation, and there was a phone call one day, uh, and uh, it was the teaching leader for Bible Study Fellowship, was on the other end of the line. Her husband was a developer, very successful. Uh, and I hear my aunt talking to this lady, and I hear the conversations like, uh, they're going to Hawaii, they can't find a gardener, uh, they, want, they, they need to have somebody come take the, the care of their estate while they're gone. So my aunt says, well, my... You know, my nephew's here. He, he, he's a gardener at Dallas Seminary. Perhaps he could help you on vacation. I'm thinking, what, what? I'm on vacation? So she hands me the phone. So I got the phone. Hi, hi Rochelle. How are you? Uh, oh, you need a gardener? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, sure. Uh, she, she, do I need to come out and see it? No, I don't need to see it. Uh, I'll take it. How, how much do you want to pay me? So she, we negotiated a price. And so uh, I said, I'd do it. Then came the day that I drove out there to do the lawn. I drove out in the country I'd never been to their house before, and I got there, and it was a massive estate. Massive. Did I say massive? I parked my little Camaro there, and I'm looking at this place going, oh my gosh, this is acres of turf to infinity with trees planted all over it in strategic locations, which means I can't just mow a line. I got to go around all these trees. There's hundreds of trees. What was I thinking? And I told them I'd do this for like 60 bucks, maybe 600 See, it's a spiritual thing, is it not? What did I tell him? I'll do it. I can't call him in Hawaii going, I'm sitting in your driveway looking at, you know, like five acres of turf. I ain't doing it. No, I told him I'll do it. And so I did it. Now I learned never to do a bid over the telephone. I, I did learn. But if you are a person of your word, you follow and fulfill your word. That is what uh, David says a man of God is supposed to do. And then he says, uh, additionally, uh, you're also a person who doesn't put out his money to interest. See, a Jew could loan money to non-Jews and charge interest, but according to the Torah, Exodus 22:25 or Leviticus 25:35, you couldn't loan money to a Jew with heavy interest. The word for interest in the Hebrew text means something with a bite. Isn't that what interest is? Yeah. Uh, he says you you don't, you don't want to do that. I went on to a few. Uh, quick loans this week to see what do they charge for uh, loans for people that, that need money quickly. 
Wow. Uh, I went to a number of sites. It ranged between 7.16% and 29% interest on money that you need quickly. That's money with a bite. And he says, you're not the kind of person that if you see somebody with an issue that you cannot wait to charge them way more than they're, they're going to pay you at the bank. What are you getting at the bank anyway? Like 0.0001%. Nothing. But I can loan my money to this person in a desperate situation. I can get 5%, honey. Praise God. Mm -hmm. No, he says, you don't put your money out to people in need with heavy interest. You don't charge them interest at all. Uh, my same uncle that I was at their house years ago to where I wound up mowing that lawn, my uncle Tony, um, when I got to the point where I uh, needed a larger car because I had kids, but I had a little Camaro uh, and they all didn't fit in the Camaro. Uh, he, and I couldn't afford another car. He came to me and he said, I'm going to buy you a car. He already bought my Camaro. Uh, so he said, I'm going to buy you another car. I'm going to buy you a bigger car. So go find one. So, so we did. Chevy Caprice Classic, largest car on the planet. <laughs> Trunk to infinity. It was awesome. He bought me that car, even though I was making $20,000 a year and couldn't afford it. And he said, just pay me back when you want to. So I started making payments. And I quickly realized I will never pay this car off. So one day he called me and he said, hey, Marty, you know that money? Of the, you know, I paid for that car. Don't worry about it. I don't need the money. Just enjoy that car. See, that's a, that's a godly person. No interest. No interest. And then he says, lastly, this, this is a person who does not take a bribe against an innocent person. He doesn't take a bribe. I mean, you're not for sale. When my dad was a federal agent working a truck gate on the, on the border of Mexicali and Calexico, uh, he, he said one day a cartel offered him his entire year's salary to let one truck drive by. I said, Dad, what'd you do? He said, I told him, no way. That's happening on my shift. No way. See, he, he could have said, I could use that for college. I could use that for X, Y, Z. My dad said, no, I'm not for sale. I don't take bribes. I don't take bribes. Are you a person that's uh, tempted to take a bribe? Many are in our culture. You see, if you're a godly person, you're not for sale because you have integrity. And that kind of thing affects your worship of God. What kind of person are you going to be? What's the promise if you maintain your inner life as you're walking with God. Well, the promise is the last part of verse five, and here's what he closes with. He says, he who does these things will what? Never be shaken. What does that mean? Well, I'll put it into football terms since there's not much football going on right now, nor baseball for that matter. Let's, uh, let's talk about football guys from the past who are not shaken. I'll give you a quick tour and just make something spiritual out of these guys. Uh, Larry Zonka, remember him? Do you remember him? Yeah, Larry Zonka. Uh, he, he was called the bulldozer. Why? He just blew through people when he had the football. Um, uh, Jerome Bettis, uh, again, awesome runner. Uh, he, he was also called the bus. Because when he came at you, it's just like, hey, pass right on by. Big dude with the football. Uh, who else is up here? I, I put a Washington Redskin up here. Who is it? John Riggins? Yeah. Uh, John Riggins. Uh, he was called the Diesel. The Diesel. Why? This is long before Vin Diesel. The Diesel. He just ran right over you. And then, uh, then lastly, one of my favorites uh, here. Do you recognize the last football player in the bottom quarter? Who is it? Walter Payton. Man, what a machine. Give him the football. He was all over the field. I mean, breaking tackles, running into the end zone. I mean, this, what's this got to do with spirituality? Everything. Because God says, if you maintain these 10 things I talk about, you watch your inner life so that you, you're confessional. You, you, you spend a lot of time getting yourself cleaned up, asking for forgiveness before you approach my throne. Well, then the promise is in life, no matter what the devil hurls at you, you're going to be like one of those guys with a football, but spiritually speaking, on the playing field of life, you're not going to get tackled. And it ain't going to happen that you're going to be taken out because God's going to empower your legs and your arms. You're going to be a force to be dealt with the devil's going to have a problem with you. I don't know about you, but I want to be like that, spiritually speaking. Strong and sure-footed. How do you get that way? Well, you maintain an inner life. As you approach God's holiness, you ask yourself, am I holy? Am I living a holy life? And if not, God, clean me up. Wash me clean and make me available for you. Be those kind of people. God will do great things in and through your life. Let's pray. God. David, uh, such an introspective man to be a politician, to be a king, uh, to be a father. What, what a man of God he was. He was so real with his faith, and we can learn and have learned so much from his pen. 
may we take the things uh, that we've learned today uh, about being careful how we approach you uh, and give much time and attention uh, to confession, to introspection, so that when we walk into your presence, uh, your face smiles upon us because you see us dealing with the sin before your throne. I pray you would empower us and fulfill your word to us that we would run strong and hard for you and do great things for you in a culture that desperately needs great saints. And we pray that we might be those kind of people in Christ's name. Amen.